Hey there, welcome back. We're on video number 33. This is sub element 7 delta of the amateur extra licensing exam. And let's get ready. So, question number one we're talking about power supplies. How does a linear electronic voltage regulator work? The conduction of a control element is varied to maintain a constant output voltage. So looking at the linear regulator, it has quite a few extra parts. They're actually contained in a package and they're very easy to use. They have an input, they have the regulator section and then they or the adjustment section and then they have an output. So you have VN is passed through some kind of switching network. Uh, it's not really switching. It just varies a little bit based on what the output current is. And that way it keeps a linear output voltage. So the conduction of a control element, the adjustment, is varied to maintain a constant output voltage. How does a switch mode voltage regulator work? That is by varying the duty cycle of pulses input to a filter. And we have a switch mode right here. Switch mode uses a on-off circuit. It's, a, it's basically an oscillator that turns on and off really fast. And in order to control the output voltage, you have this timing right here that's the duty cycle and if you have a very low duty cycle with a short pulse in and then a long section that is off this inductor is really going to pump it and then if you just have dc going through you just have voltage in so that's how a switch mode power switch mode power supply works it uses on and off on and off oscillation it varies that duty cycle of pulses the frequency remains the same it's just the duty cycle of those pulses what device is used as a stable voltage reference and that's the zener diode and this is a voltage re reference and regulator and it outputs whatever voltage the zener diode is set in its reverse bias and i think that this shows you there's different types of zener diodes that can provide you with different levels of output even when they're combined and there there's a whole bunch of different types of zener diodes with different power ratings which of the following describes a three terminal voltage regulator? So a three terminal is a series regulator. And that is what this guy is. This is a LM317. And it's one of the more popular ones because you can vary the output voltage of a 317. If you have a 7805, then you have a positive five volts and that's what it's set at internally. If you have a 7905, you have a negative 5 volts. Again, set internally at 5 volts. If you have a 7812, then that is a positive 12 volts. The LM317 is a positive, and it can be anywhere between 0 and your input voltage, or pretty close to it. That is your three terminal voltage regulator is a series regulator which of the following types of linear voltage regulator operates by loading the unregulated voltage source and that is going to be a shunt regulator and i have a shunt regulator right here and it shunts right here that's the shunt part and they just operate a little bit differently and if you wanted to check out a shunt regulator i think you can build these in tinkercad and kind of get an idea about how they work i think tinkercad will uh, simulate that very well 
What is the purpose of Q1, this transistor, in the circuit shown in figure E7-2? Well, you can see that this is where your main current passes through. So it controls the current to keep the output voltage constant. That's what this is used for. This is where your current passes through and it's used to control that current to keep the output voltage constant. What is the purpose of C2, capacitor 2, in the circuit shown in figure E7-2? So circuit or, or C2 is to bypass the rectifier, that's the rectifier output ripple around D1. So there's going to be some ripple, and this is the rectifier over here. And there's some ripple that might pass through still, and it bypasses that ripple. And this is basically a filter. Both of these put together is a filter. So C2 is that, and it's R1 to C2 is the filter. I was pointing at that. I was actually meaning to point at this resistor. But that bypasses the ripple, so this is a very stable reference point right here. What type of circuit is shown in figure E7-2? Oh, it's the same one, but this is a linear voltage regulator. If we go back and look at this, let me see if they give you the equivalent circuit. Sometimes when you look at a data sheet, they'll give you an equivalent circuit. This is their functional block diagram. It's arranged a little bit differently, but you can see that it has some of the same things, but there's more built in. This one has over temp and over current protection, which is really nice. You just turn it off and turn it, let it cool off and turn it back on and it resets itself. And I'm not stopping because the dogs are barking at a leaf blowing by. How is battery operating time calculated? That is the capacity of your battery in amp hours divided by the average current of your load. So I've worked this out for you in wonderful picture in math. You can see the battery. It's 100 amp hours. Now ignore the fact that I didn't connect the ground or the negative. But you have 100 amp hour capacity battery. Your load averages 20 amp hours over the course of an hour. So in order to figure it out, you take your capacity in amp hours. So you have a time there in amp hours. That's the time. That's the current. And they're put together for current time. And you divide that by your cur current average, which is, is in amps. Well, an amp divided by an amp cancels out. That leaves you with, an, with your time. So 100 amp hours divided by 20 amp hour load gives you approximately five hours of operating time. This neglects the duty cycle of whatever mode you're using. So those of us that have done parks on the air, we pretty much have this figured out at the end with our little meter. We know over a course of time how much current we used and that average current can be calculated and then we'll know next time you know, if I have another activation where I mostly call CQ, I know I'm going to burn up a lot more than if I have a pile up. Your, your duty cycle is going to change. Why is a switching type power supply less expensive and lighter than the equivalent linear power supply? A linear power supply is going to use a very large transformer. The higher the current, the bigger the transformer has to be. Transformers in themselves are super expensive. So a switching power supply actually uses, let's uh, look here, it uses an, an inductor. Now an inductor doesn't like changes. So when it cr uses the uh, pulse width, it creates a back EMF and a forward EMF and that electromotive force can be greater sometimes than the actual input voltage. So it's really neat how 
how these things can work. Um, so the switching type power supply is less expensive and lighter than its equivalent linear power supply because the high frequency inverter design uses a much smaller transformer and filter components for the equivalent power output. It's quite fancy. There are trade-offs. Linear power supplies are linear. They're, they don't make a lot of noise. A switching power supply by birth makes noise because it has a frequency. It's switching, and it's switching with a square wave, which fundamentally contains a lot of frequencies added together to keep it at that flat level. So there's a lot of racket that happens with these. They take a lot of filtering, and your cheaper ones, like you charge your phones, those are probably what are making a bunch of RF racket in your radio. How do I know? Because I deal with it on a daily basis. What is the purpose of an inverter connected to a solar panel output? An inverter converts the panel's output from DC to AC. And we have some expensive ones here. You can get some more less expensive ones. Uh, these are for your house or for your campers, so they're way expensive. If you're just converting it for 12 volts and a couple of amps uh, for using something, they could be a lot less than this. Not really recommended for running your radio because guess what? Your radio doesn't mind DC. That's what it's made for. If you're using an inverter to then run your switching power supply, you're defeating the purpose. So if you already have a 12 volt power supply, 12 volt battery, you don't need an inverter. But if you need to run something else, that's what it's there for. What is the dropout voltage of a linear voltage regulator? That is the minimum input to output voltage required to maintain regulation. If you have a LM3 or an a LM317, it's going to have a dropout voltage, and I don't see where the dropout voltage is in the data sheet. Um, it's in there somewhere. We're not going to look for it. But if you're trying to get through this circuit, if you're trying to get 25 volts on the output and you only put 12 volts at the input, that's below the dropout. It's not going to work. So that's what the dropout is. It's, it's the minimum input to output voltage required to maintain that regulation. Which of the following calculates power dissipated by a series linear voltage regulator? That is the voltage difference between the input and output and it's multiplied by the output current. So if we switch over to this wonderful drawing that I have here, this goes down to P equals I times E. And when you have a voltage drop across a linear power supply like this, do you know where all of your extra power goes that's not used between the 12 and the 5? It's lost as heat. So there's there's nothing free here. That's why switch mode power supplies are better because they're not wasting a bunch of stuff in heat. They just make a lot of noise. But I worked this out. So P equals I times E. So for the 7805, that's voltage in minus voltage out multiplied times what your current draw is of your load. So if we have 12 volts in, 5 volts out, and we are pulling 2 amperes, that's 2 amps times 12 minus 5. 12 minus 5 is 7 times 2 equals 14 watts. Now why is that important, 14 watts? That doesn't sound bad at all. But if we go back to the web and look at the data sheet for a 7805, this isn't a definitive answer, but if you look at the thermal resistances, you're going to get a 5 Celsius degree rise in temperature for every watt that has to pass through that linear voltage regulator. 
And then you have a junction to air that is going to be 65 degrees per watt. So imagine if you didn't have a heat sink on this thing with um, some, some active air passing by it, some active cooling, this thing's going to get hot regardless. So even if you ignore the junction to air, let's do junction to case. That junction to case, 5 times 14 is 70 Celsius that you're going to see a rise. So if you're at room temperature, you're at 95 degrees Celsius already. You are getting close to a thermal runaway at this point. Um, so you want to be able to pull that heat off. Now that's way beyond what you need to know, but that's an explanation about why that is important. If you're going to convert uh, 12 volts to 5 volts, you might want to find a different input voltage because that is going to dissipate a bunch of heat. What is the purpose of a connecting equal value resistors across power supply filter capacitors connected in series? And all of these choices are correct. You want to equalize the voltage across each capacitor. You also want to discharge capacitors when voltage is removed. That's a safety factor. If you don't have that resistor across the, the capacitor, then it's going to hold that charge. And when you open it, you might get zapped. But it also provides a minimum load on the supply. You want a power supply to have a minimum load. Otherwise, it may not be quite happy. The voltage could fluctuate. And when you connect something to it, it could cause some, some issues on the back end there. C the connecting of equal value resistors across a power supply filter capacitor connected in series is all of these choices are correct. The last one. What is the purpose of a step start circuit in a high voltage power supply? That is to allow the filter capacitors to charge gradually. It also takes it easy on the capacitors and the rest of the system because if a capacitor starts at zero volts and you apply a voltage this high with, with no resistance, the amount of current that's going to flow is going to be insane. So a step start, a step start kind of fills it up a little bit, fills it up a little bit. That way you don't have a high current flowing, which could possibly blow the fuse on your input. So you want to limit that amount of current. Alrighty, this has been a fun one to explain. I hope that I've done a fairly decent job of trying to explain this stuff to you so that you can have a little bit of understanding. You can go read some books and go look at some scholarly articles on the web. And scholarly could be from manufacturers. It could be from engineers. If you want to know more about voltage regulation, and you know why that's cool? Because you may want to build a variable power supply that you can use at your desk. These are hobbies that we could do very easily as electronics tinkers. So if this video has been helpful, hit the like button. If it has not been helpful, please ignore hitting the dislike button. And I, I implore you, like this video if it is so in your inclination please subscribe to the channel if you don't want notifications you don't have to click the bell you can change the bell to a, a gray crossed out arrow and then when i post videos to notify subscribers you won't get notification it won't drive you nuts but it does help me out as a content creator thanks so much we'll catch you on the next one